Uh, it's my real pleasure to be with everybody tonight. Uh, we've got an absolutely terrific lineup of speakers for what is the final event of our fall semester. It's been a semester unlike any other in my years in higher education, and I'm sure you all feel the same way too. But we're here, it's December, the holidays are almost upon us. Uh, we wanna thank everybody who's been a part of this series this semester for spending some time with us to consider what's going on around the world and around our country. Uh, and we're thrilled to be able to bring you this conversation tonight. We're looking at the state of U.S.-China relations, uh, not just in the in the Biden administration, but even beyond that. Uh, what is the future of the relationship between the world's two largest economies? Uh, what are the implications for China's island-building campaign, for its uh, policies of political pressure on friends of the United States in that part of the world and increasingly uh, in other parts of the world as well? We've got a lot to talk about and a great crew uh, that has uh, that is joining us tonight. I'm going to give you a quick introduction on each, knowing full well that everybody who joined here also received these biographies uh, via email earlier today. But I'll give you uh, these folks in the order in which they'll be speaking. Uh, we're going to kick off with Dinda Elliott. She's Senior Vice President and Director of Programs at the China Institute. And she previously worked at the Paulson Institute, which promotes U.S.-China relations and sustainable growth. Uh, after Dinda, we're going to hear from Ambassador Nick Platt. He served for 12 years at the helm of the Asia Society, and he is an Asia hand, a China specialist and three-time U.S. ambassador, serving in Zambia, the Philippines, and Pakistan. Next up will be Dr. Lewis Rutherford. He's a Harvard-educated financier who co-founded Asia's oldest and longest continuously operating venture capital management company, InterAsia Management, which was awarded for continued excellence in venture, cap in venture capital. I should also note that Lewis is a member of the advisory board of the Pell Center and has been in residence at the Pell Center technically for the last year and a half, but for the last nine months like the rest of us, He's been displaced by the pandemic. And uh, bringing us home tonight is going to be uh, Dr. Gary Jefferson. Uh, he teaches and has published widely about institutions, technology, economic growth, and China's economy. He's currently at Brandeis University. It's a great crew. They've got great insights. And to get us started, we're going to begin with Dinda Elliott. Dinda. Okay, just let me make sure I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? You're loud and clear. Okay, so first I want to thank you so much to the Pell Center for Public Policy and Jim Ludas for including me. Uh, I have looked up to Ambassador Platt for decades, and I am absolutely thrilled and honored to be here with him and Lewis and Gary. Uh, so I am not a policy person. Uh, I work at China Institute, whose mission is to inform people about China through a school, a gallery, and a host of public programs. We are striving to add nuance to a conversation about China that has become increasingly black and white. So in my allotted time, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I think we Americans get wrong about China. Uh, I believe there's an alarming level of misunderstanding and lack of knowledge of China in the U.S., even among very educated Americans. Um, in my view, that is extremely dangerous because China, as you said, Jim, is the second largest economy in the world, and we need to interact. And to do that, we need we simply need to understand China. Um, first, just to set the stage, Americans, as you probably know, are very negative about China these days. A recent Pew poll showed that 73% of Americans have negative attitudes towards China. Um, why? Well, there are lots of reasons. Globalization, people being left behind economically, China's repressive policies domestically and behavior on the global stage. Um, the negative feelings are also being fueled by our own propaganda, in my view. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo made a speech in July in which he made it clear that he sees China as the enemy. He said, quote, General Secretary Xi Jinping is a true believer in a bankrupt totalitarian ideology. It's this ideology that informs his decades long desire for global hegemony of Chinese communism. Pompeo went on to suggest that many Chinese students and employees are spies sent to America uh, sent here to steal intellectual property. He said, communists almost always lie. The biggest lie that they tell is to think that they speak for 1.4 billion people who are surveilled, 
oppressed and scared to speak out. So I think this is how we Americans generally view China. Uh, we tend to think that because they don't have a democratic system and live under Communist Party rule, they must be unhappy. Um, looking at it from our own American perspective, there's understandable reason to think so, as we read that the government is cracking down on Uyghurs in Xinjiang, on freedom-loving protesters in Hong Kong, and as we learn that it arrests human rights lawyers and dissidents. Um, but do the Chinese people feel downtrodden? I don't think so. I think that's the number one thing we get wrong about China. We tend to think the Chinese feel oppressed by the Communist Party. And in fact, according to recent research, people in China generally seem to like their government. Harvard University's Ash Center recently published a fascinating report following a longitudinal survey over 15 years of public opinion. In 2016, 95.5% of respondents were either relatively satisfied or highly satisfied with their government, with the central government. And COVID has actually increased people's happiness about their government. Uh, in April, York University in Canada polled nearly 20,000 Chinese citizens, and more than 90% said they were satisfied with how China's national leaders managed the outbreak. Nearly half said they had become more trusting of their national government since the outbreak. When you look at local, at the local level, people are less happy with their government. But the point is that the Chinese are not longing for a change in their system of government. And in the meantime, Chinese views of the U.S. sadly have turned steadily more negative as a result of our continued COVID crisis, our anti-China policies, and the general political disarray in the United States. Um, the second thing I think we get wrong is I think we underestimate their quality of life in China. Life in China is pretty good these days. Um, you know, just look at income levels, income levels alone from 2000 to 2019, disposable income per capita in China increased by around 700% for urban and rural households alike. In the cities, income went from $1,500 in 1990 to $42,000 in 2019. And in the countryside, income went from $686 in, in uh, 20 years ago to 16,000 uh, in less than, you know, in the year 2019. Um, 40 years of economic development. I mean, that's a whole lifetime of increasing prosperity with a whole generation and more who have never experienced real hardship. Uh, to understand why China behaves the way it does, we have just got to remember where China came from. When I first went to mainland China in 1979, I remember my first stop was Guangzhou. And this was a city that was indescribably poor. There were dim orange light bulbs on street corners surrounded by utter darkness and people, people slurping noodles on tiny stools. The poverty and low standard of living was absolutely overwhelming. And there was real fear, too. The Cultural Revolution was a decade of unimaginable turmoil and persecution and cruelty. It was tangible. Today, of course, Guangzhou is a glittering modern, modern city. And to put things on a, a somewhat more human level, I recently talked to Cindy Chen, who's a tea producer in a village in Fujian, in preparation for a program we're doing in a few weeks at China Institute. Cindy grew up with illiterate parents in a mud house in a village. And then she went to school and learned English and the family tea business expanded. They got, they got their first TV in 2000. And now just 20 years later, the family has moved into town. They have a big factory. They own three or four cars. And there she is talking on Zoom with me in English. Cindy is feeling pretty good about her life. Um, the Chinese are traveling, they're eating, they're shopping to make up for lost time these days. And in, in just two decades, China has become the world's largest outbound travel market with some 145 million Chinese travelers traveling abroad in 2017. That means they're seeing the world and they're bringing back ideas. Uh, China is also ahead of U the US in terms of everyday convenience. With WeChat, people can do everything from book movies, to buy insurance, to get a bank loan and talk with friends. 
And digital delivery services are way beyond what we have here in the US. So you can get whatever you want almost instantaneous, instantaneously in China. The third thing I think we don't get right is I think we underestimate the optimism in China. In a 2018 Gates Foundation survey, 94% of Chinese youth from 12 to 15 years old were optimistic about China's future. And that compares with 64% of their American counterparts who felt optimistic. Uh, America, among adults, 88% of, of the Chinese were positive about the future of China compared to 56% of those in the US. The fourth thing I think we get wrong is we tend to think that the Chinese still admire America and see us as some kind of a model. Um, that is sadly less and less true. Patriotism and national pride are on the rise. You know, for the first time, people in China feel proud to be Chinese. So, so why does all this matter? I think it matters because we in the US are in danger of falling behind and not even realizing it as China races into the future. Instead of pointing fingers and instead of trying to keep China down, which won't work anyway, I think we need to focus on how to make America more competitive, how to drive innovation. I, I just fear that if we delude ourselves about our superiority, then we may end up in a position where we'll be left dangerously behind. Um, so I think I'll stop at that and let others speak and then I look forward to our conversation. Super, Dinda. Thank you so much. For folks who have uh, never joined us before, the way this works, and I should have teed this up up front, is that the panel will speak uh, about seven to ten minutes each of introductory remarks, and then we're going to uh, go quickly to the questions that you post in the comment section on Facebook Live. So you don't have to wait to the very end. If you've got a question that comes to you why this, while the speakers are speaking, Post it there. I'll grab it. I'll moderate it, and I'll make sure that it gets uh, that we get to as many of them as we possibly can uh, before the program is over tonight. So, with that preface, now let me pass the baton to Ambassador Nick Platt. Ambassador Platt, take it away. Um, I'm going to give you a little history here. Um, I was present when the China-U.S. relationship began. Uh, I was on the Nixon trip. I was stationed in Beijing when we opened our liaison offices. Chinese call me the fossil who talks. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do now is tell you a little bit about the background here. The relations between us began in two different ways, forming two different tracks. One, emphasizing the balance of power between governments, and the other focused on links between peoples. I was present there and have stayed involved to this day. The government opening began with Nixon's trip to Beijing in 1972, which was a diplomatic balance of power moved, move designed by the Ch US and China to weaken the Soviet Union and to protect themselves and strengthen themselves against the Soviet Union. And it succeeded beyond anybody's expectations. The second opening began with the establishment a year later in 1973 of offices on the ground, offices on the ground in Beijing and Washington, empowered to organize the exchange of Chinese and American delegations, enabling the two peoples to interact with each other after decades of hostility and estrangement. Now, the government balance of power track and the people-to-people -people track developed independently over the years, but they've become intertwined and are worth tracing. These are the sinews of U.S.-China relations. The Soviet Union-centered balance of power maneuvers did not last very long. Soviet Union didn't last very long. Nixon left the scene a year later. Mao died and Mao and Joe died in 1976. Henry Kissinger kept up the balancing act as Secretary of State under Gerald Ford, successor administrations under President Carter and Reagan kept up the pressure until the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989, 1990, 1991. With the Soviet Union gone, the U.S. emerged as the sole superpower. The balance of power mechanism practically ceased to operate. There was little to balance. 
the preponderance of our power. Meanwhile, the less formal, more private people-to-people -people track had taken off. Since 1973, curiosity and self-interest on both sides fueled an almost frantic exchange of delegations. <clears throat> Our relationship began to develop in ways none of us, including the great balancers, could foresee. From the beginning, while keeping the balancing operation strictly in their own hands, Nixon and Kissinger left to government professionals on the ground in China for the first time, 73, management of what were disparagingly called the nuts and bolts issues. These included trade, investment, travel, legal claims, scientific and educational exchange, culture and sports. In short, these elements of, the, of an international relationship where individuals make the day-to-day -day decisions rather than governments. Now, over the years, aided by the forces of globalization, professionals on both sides fastened together the nuts and bolts, creating a huge economic imperative that replaced the original strategic rationale that had collapsed. The size of the structure became enormous, and what at the outset had resembled a single tactical telephone line with Kissinger at one end and Joe and Lai at the other was now a fiber optic cable carrying millions of messages a day, many of which neither government even saw. China benefited a lot from this track with the United States, aided by the intensity of its work ethic and its very low level at the beginning. Its subsequent economic rise in the decades that followed actually brought the balance of power concept back into operation. For the first time since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was power to balance in China. At the same time, the nuts and bolts became the subjects of grand strategy, vexing issues like cyber espionage, market access, the pronounced trade imbalance, exchange rates, intellectual property, freedom of navigation, the development of clear rules for direct investors in both directions, to name a few, became topics discussed at the highest levels of both governments. Common ground issues like cl climate change, counterterrorism, cultural exchange remained on the table. Now, the policy shifts of recent years, pushed by President Xi and Trump, combined with the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic have threatened the massive interdependence of these two countries. Chairman Xi has demanded that the world acknowledge the growth of China's power in statements implying that dominance is what he has in mind. He has accompanied this message with bullying diplomacy and draconian measures to control his population and strengthen the hold of the Communist Party over all aspects of Chinese life. President Trump has reacted to Xi's drive for preeminence with an all-government challenge. An all-government challenge declaring that China has become our most dangerous strategic adversary. China thinks as Dinda has says, that U.S. policy is designed to prevent it from assuming its rightful place in the world. We accuse China of getting ahead by spying on us and stealing our technology. Now, I'm frequently asked if the relationship that has changed and moved the world for almost 50 years can last. Well, I believe it can, but must change as it has in the past. Is conflict inevitable? I believe not. Bottom line, China is too big to contain and the relationship too complex to dismantle. That said, that said, our relationship is clearly at a new stage. We need to rethink our goals and objectives. 
Competition and cooperation have always been ingredients of our relationship, but with different emphases at different times. Competition has now taken pride of place, particularly where artificial intelligence, biotech, space, and military technology are concerned. We can indeed compete and are well ahead in some fields. One body of opinion inside China, and there are many, holds that she challenged us too early, waking us up, and they prefer that the PRC continue to follow Deng Xiaoping's more careful, understated approach, crossing the river, feeling the stones, keeping their national achievements quiet. As before, and this is an important point, our relations operate at different levels, and that confuses many observers. It's a bit like the weather. The contentious issues are aired publicly at high altitudes, where the winds are strong and the temperature is cold. People-to-people -people contacts, and even some government links, particularly in the financial field, continue quietly at lower altitudes, below the national level where the temperature is warmer. The buzzword is subnational relations between states, provinces, cities, companies, and institutions. These are where we should put our emphasis. I work for the Philadelphia Orchestra, and I first met them when they came to China in 1973, and I and it continues to be welcome in China and planning for the future. Economic activity in general remains busy despite the tariffs and the talk and the, and, and the, 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 the virus. In 2018, U.S. firms in China earned, hold on to your hats, $500 billion in the PRC. The virus, and let me look at looking at today's headlines, Chinese, China's trade surplus re reached a record high today. The virus has stalled international student activity almost completely, but this, I think, will revive to some extent once the vaccines kick in and the danger abates. Looking ahead, Domestic politics will be a major determinant of policy in both countries. Our ability to pull off a peaceful transfer of power will be crucial to our ability to fashion a sensible new policy. President-elect Biden has made it clear that he will maintain some of the tough Trump trade and technology policies. But at the very least, we can expect a more civil tone and a search for areas of agreement. I believe we can and will come up with a new formula, something that allows us to compete while avoiding confrontation. The Chinese government, if you read Wang Yi's most recent speech, may have something similar in mind. Wang Yi is the foreign minister. They need international peace and quiet to address severe domestic problems, including crushing debt throughout the economy, environmental degradation, a broken um, health system, and a falling population, just to name a few. So they've got plenty on their mind, as we have too. And we need to figure out a way of sticking it out and working things together. We'll all be watching in the crucial months and days to come. So I'm going to hand over to Lewis now. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you so much, Ambassador Platt. And folks, again, a reminder, if you've got questions that you want answered, please feel free to post those in the comment section on Facebook Live. And Lewis, I'm going to turn it over to you. You need to unmute your microphone. Okay. What I would like to do is I would like to discuss what it is like to be an investor in China, 
which is a little bit different than the academic world, a little bit different than uh, commenting on the politics or the happiness of the people. And it has its limitations, but I think it's an interesting point of view. I would then like to quote a Mr. Hansen of the Hoover Institute, who is a known hawk. And what that seems to be about is discussing the subject of the practices and the behavior of the Chinese government. I would like to make the point, first of all, that all the people on this panel have a wonderful respect and affection for the Chinese people. And those of us like Gary and Nick and myself who have been in Asia for 40 or 50 years, we can safely say that we admire and respect and have tremendous affection for the Chinese people and their culture. Some of my comments are on a different thing. The Communist Party of China and its behavior and its strategy and its actually stated goals. This is, I think, particularly interesting. So I will quote a hawk on this subject. Then I would like to discuss what the Chinese have been doing, the Communist Party, since the pandemic started. I'd like to discuss the strategy of our present president. I'd like to say if that's going to change under the elected new president. And then I would like to ask people who are listening to this, do they really care about this subject? Does China rising matter to them? And is there anything that they would like to do about it if they had the chance to talk to the Communist Party of China, if they had a chance to talk to the <laughs> elected government of Biden? Can you, can you hear me, Jim? Loud and clear, loud and clear. I'm just going to remind you, though, that you got seven to ten minutes. So just that's a, that's an ambitious agenda. Yes, uh, that seven to ten minutes, I think, starts now. So let me talk about what it is like to be a investor in China briefly. This is determined by our clients, our investors that give us money. And it has a particular aspect to it, a very comprehensive risk analysis, which forces you not to think very much about how happy the Chinese people are. It is very clear that they have been, have, they have had many chances to be miserable. And this is a chance for them to be much more happy. And whether you wish to comment about how their public rights, their, their human rights are abused. I think it's just better for them at this time. But back to the risk analysis, I have to answer questions, very, very pointed questions about certain things to do with China. For example, would I phrase the government to be steady or volatile? Do I believe they have laws that they observe? Or are they essentially making it up as they go along? Do they prefer locals or foreigners? Do they appreciate technology and its protection? Is the environment a serious problem? Can you protect your customers? What industry is the government involved with or industries? And are, your, are they your competitor if you're in this industry, in your investment? Are they corrupt? The answer to those questions, although largely negative, are the same for Indonesia, are the same for Thailand, are the same for Japan, and anywhere where you wish to invent invest. The problem seems to be in all of this stuff, whether you're winning or losing, is is their behavior, strategy and goals important to your investment? Or is it 
as the son of the hawks would say, out of control. So I wish to quote to you a hawk from the Hudson Institute at Stanford University. His name is Hansen, and he had an op-ed piece in the New York Times quite recently. I'm not gonna give you all of it, but I would like to mention some of the things he says. I'm quoting now. After changing Mao's murderous planned economy, Hong Xiaoping's successful revolution came at a cost of terrible environmental damage in China. It included the rapid destruction of numerous Chinese communities along the dams to do with the Yangtze River. It included continued civil oppression and numbing human rights abuse. Importantly, he adds, with no aggressive neighbors or global threats to China as of 1970 and onward, China has built a blue water navy from essentially sampans. It has invaded the Himalaya part of India, the Himalaya part of Bhutan. It has enslaved Tibet imprisoned a million Muslim Uyghurs, bulldozed mosques, churches, and synagogues, started building space weapons, created bases in the disputed South China Sea area, disputed by Japan, the Philippines, and Vietnam. It has violated every tenet of international trade, stolen patents and copyrights, dumped products below cost globally, manipulated its currency, created vast espionage networks to steal technology and advance its military. And it has bullied its neighbors and recipients of its aid. Essentially, I think that sounds a bit like the USA but we did have serious enemies when we behaved this way. What is China doing post pandemic, which is in fact the China pandemic? Is it softening, apologizing? Not at all. Recent articles in the New York Times on China's communist playbook for the world's economies to obey. China has said, accepting China's example of its power, the world will benefit from our technology and strength. So accept our trade practices and behavior. Interesting, no? Dissidents in Hong Kong disappear quite recently. This is the new power the stooge Hong Kong government has implemented for China after years of protest by Hong Kong citizens, including myself. Recently, there has been a further invasion of Himalaya Bhutan, a reinvasion invasion of Himalaya India, an upgrade to the Trinko Mali Harbor in Sri Lanka, which was awarded to China because of its massive loans to Sri Lanka. This was done on the basis that China would never make it a naval base. It has. So there are other examples of how China is acting post-China pandemic. What seems to be the Chinese policy of our very unpopular US president? There is a technology war going on with people such as Huawei who was denied USA chips and USA NATO markets based on strong connections to the Chinese military. There is a ban on TikTok and WeChat in the USA. Congress has asked for more funds for China intelligence research and has received them. Leaders of PRC companies with ties to the military subject to arrest now in USA 
and impounding of their assets. This includes the Stooge government in Hong Kong that has recently reacted so severely under China. There is a threat of increased tariffs on Chinese goods in China for they're not complying to the promised increased purchases of US farm consumer and other products. There is increased support for Taiwan. So I ask you, what might this, how might this change with the new administration? The answer to which would include whether Biden, President-elect Biden can keep the liberals and socialists away from this issue. There is bipartisan support for aid increase for Taiwan. Some of president-elect advisors, party associates are angry about China's crackdown on Hong Kong. There seems to be no mandate to be soft or nice to the Communist Party of China. Biden, President-elect Biden has stated that he will invest massively in manufacturing technology and AI. President-elect Biden has called Xi Jinping a thug. So there might be a continuation of what's going on right now. China is not going away. They are in your life now. Do you care? Do you want to consider some ways to let them know about their behavior and to let our USA government know about your support for aspects of our policy towards China rising? Here are some things to consider. Military expenditure voting. Theft of technology, 5G stuff in Huawei, the finance loans and access to our finance markets, to state-owned corporations, Taiwan aid, and surely our alliances and our friends letting China know how they think about our behavior is important and certainly hasn't happened under our president. Ms. Thea Lee, president of the Economic Policy Institute of America, who Gary probably knows, has said there are lots of tools in the US trade box, toolbox. I would like to see the Biden administration be thoughtful and strategic about using them. One problem to this is, has been put by Jörg Watke, of the European Chamber of Commerce in China. They have a toolbox, but it only seems to have one tool, a hammer. Thank you for thinking about this and reading the paper about this. And I'd like to invite any of you to ask questions about this hawkish problem Thank you so much, Lewis. We're going to kick it over now to Gary Jefferson from Brandeis University. Good. You can see it. Roger. So, Jim, I want to thank you very much and the Pell Center for organizing this event and inviting the four of us here to participate. We have uh, at least three of us have presented a uh, wonderful uh, ver a variety of views and um, I anticipate I'll build upon that, hopefully for the better, um, in part because of my uh, training and perspective as, a, as an economist. So I, I think we all agree that uh, we stand at a crossroads of history. The United States is at a crossroads. China is at a crossroads. And certainly that relationship is at a crossroads. I had anticipated that before me, someone might refer to uh, Graham Allison's uh, conception of the Thucydides trap. That is the uh, dynamic of conflict between a rising power and established uh, hegemon, often uh, resulting in war. 
I'd like to think, I think that probably most agree that uh, given the state of the world now and the prospect of uh, mutually assured destruction, if we were to go to war with another superpower, that this uh, war, as Lewis has suggested, is likely to center more on technology and involve uh, the deployment or withholding of semiconductors uh, versus swords. I do uh, deeply feel that this uh, debate and uh, initiatives with regard to uh, decoupling, although it has various dimensions, I think that it is uh, fundamentally extremely costly and uh, basically unfeasible, and I have four reasons to uh, suggest this. The first is that uh, I think as we understand, technology is a public good. We may not understand the extent to which it's a public good that's accessible to everyone, in that the uh, global patent system and every country that has a, a patent office runs that office in such a way that when you file a patent, you have to include a transparent description of the technology that basically provides sufficient detail so that it's a recipe enabling someone else to be able to replicate and build upon that technology. The patent does not restrict the diffusion of the technology as an idea. It restricts the right to use the technology for commercial purposes by others. So when we upload a a patent or China uploads a patent that becomes accessible to uh, the rest of the world. The second reason is that um, China and the US might uh, engage in a war, but uh, basically the rest of the world as things stand now is going to uh, persist and probably become as uh, China has more to offer uh, technologically and economically. Uh, the rest of the world will take the best from both sides and as such uh, represent a, a, a bridge uh, between the two countries. Uh, third is that uh, it's a fact, it's been referenced several times, that China is on this track to overtake uh, the U.S. with regard to uh, GDP, its uh, global economic presence, which means that the balance of power is... Uh, uh, even if ever so slowly, shifting away from the U.S. toward China. And the third reason is that uh, there are simply too many technology niches that require scale and specialization to exploit. And that includes uh, areas of uh, biomedical research, uh, telecommunications, uh, transport and so forth. Uh, so there is a division of labor that inevitably uh, needs to evolve so that if uh, the U.S. is able to develop a, uh, a remedy for Alzheimer's and the Chinese uh, develop a battery that can uh, transport over a thousand miles, it's uh, exceedingly unlikely that those technologies will uh, in fact be decoupled from the other side. But we can talk about this. I look forward to discussing it uh, further. So basically, how do we get to this point? I think it's important to understand. We all agree it's important to understand why we are at the place we are at the moment. And um, that in turn frames where we move from this point forward. So I would uh, characterize this, uh, this particular decade. Um, 1995 to 2005 is the golden age of U.S.-Chinese relations. This is the uh, period during which uh, the Prime Minister Zhu Rongji uh, was an exceedingly aggressive reformer, having um, reshaped China's uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, laying off uh, millions of uh, surplus workers, privatizing uh, tens of thousands of these uh, state-owned enterprises with a view toward shaping up uh, China sufficiently so that it might be able to enter the WTO, which did it uh, successfully at the end of 2001. 
which uh, represented a substantial sort of opening uh, in terms of uh, trade and uh, investment uh, as a result of that accession. So also during this time, uh, most American, large American companies established a footprint in China, and there seemed to be a clear division of comparative advantage with uh, the US and uh, other advanced uh, countries providing uh, technology, business know-how, supply chains, chain, chains and uh, their own um, export markets uh, for the growing supply of uh, Chinese goods. And on the Chinese side, of course, uh, there was a, uh, an ample supply of uh, inexpensive but uh, literate and uh, increasingly skilled labor and uh, growing domestic markets. One of the more important features of this period was the, uh, I guess as Nick put it, the the people to people relationship in Dinda also. Uh, and uh, perhaps a highlight of that was uh, the visit in 1998 by uh, President Clinton and uh, First Lady Hillary Clinton when he gave a talk at uh, Beijing University and uh, was warmly received, she in turn was uh, advocating uh, women's rights in China and around the world. And I mention this because arguably it represents the uh, sort of a height of uh, a time when there was a deep regard across China's population, its intelligentsia, its youth for uh, the United States. And um, arguably thereafter, it began to uh, diminish. 15 years later, now in 2020, uh, the world has changed. China has uh, substantially transformed from an imitation economy to an innovation economy. I've uh, listed a few of the uh, technology areas where China is uh, near or at the global frontier, technology frontier. Um, there's been an attitude shift. Uh, these two countries always have, but uh, perhaps uh, more than ever. Uh, it's, uh, it's enormously arrogant uh, as China emphasizes as a misnomer its quiet rise and uh, emphasizes its special characteristics versus American exceptionalism and America first. So there's a uh, you know, kind of face off, it seems, between the two countries uh, rhetorically and in terms of uh, the, uh, the imagery uh, that each is able to uh, stake out. And we've also come to a uh, difficult time of uh, general American dysfunction. So I don't want in any way, you know, particularly given uh, Lewis's uh, convincing uh, account of uh, Chinese misbehavior to understate that misbehavior, that we are facing a, a capitalist, state capitalist authoritarian government. Uh, I would not want to underestimate the amount of reform that has occurred in the along the political landscape. From an economist perspective, during the socialist period, China was a, uh, a landscape of missing markets. It is now a um, landscape of emerging or uh, in some cases rather unregulated markets. But it is arguably a capitalist state, authoritarian, authoritarian state with too much, and in some areas, too little intervention. Um, it requires technology transfers. It erects trade and investment barriers. It provides enormous uh, subsidies to state-owned enterprises. It limits the uh, access of U.S. companies to uh, deliver to, uh, digital services, and as been pointed out, it engages in um, bullying, bullying sort of around the uh, perimeter of uh, China. 
um, and is uh, sort of in the short of it, uh, violating uh, rules of the game around the globe. So that is clearly not to be uh, dismissed. However, I want to suggest that the real problem at this point, the problem over which we have some control is the American problem and that uh, it's time to get on with what I would call the American project. The American problem, I would say, is that our country has lost China's respect um, after centuries of uh, social, economic, and political chaos in China. The Chinese now have the highest concern and regard for a system that can create order and prosperity. And uh, that's a major reason, I believe, that the polls that uh, Dinda uh, cited show a uh, substantial support for uh, this administration and the Communist Party because they have been able, after a period of uh, civil war, of uh, foreign incursion, domestic rebellion, been able to bring a sustained period of social stability, territorial integrity, and uh, economic prosperity to a wide swath of the Chinese population. Now, the problem is that at the same time, during the 21st century, over the last 20 years, the United States has occasioned uh, war and chaos in the Middle East following 9-11. It uh, was uh, primarily the source of the 2008 international financial crisis, and uh, its political system has exhibited increasing dysfunction. And uh, in recent years, it has been uh, in many ways shredding the international political order and economic order. And uh, so given the uh, U.S. is the author of this uh, chaos, it's not uh, at all surprising that it has lost a great deal of uh, stature in the view of the Chinese intelligentsia and many younger Chinese as well. So I'm suggesting that the American project is one of reconstructing our social and political system, revitalizing ourselves at the center of global innovation, making the necessary investments to achieve that, reorder the G7 to define and uh, be able to effectively embed uh, the rules of the game in the international system. And then to um, reopen the door to China, refurbishing America's image and uh, having it uh, be able to indeed uh, resurrect as a model that uh, many Chinese are able to uh, respect and uh, would wish to uh, mimic and to join with the G7, that is uh, Canada and the European powers, Japan, and the two being um, South Korea and Australia in uh, Asia in order to uh, develop these, uh, these global rules of the game. Engage with China to move on and what I mean by that is to try to, as we have moved on, to uh, encourage in direct and indirect ways, a new leadership for China, including reinstating the two term limit and to uh, emphasize the fact that there really is little gain from uh, cyber um, the deployment of cyber uh, sort of technology for disruptive purposes in that as the powers have achieved mutually assured destruction, we have assured, uh, are achieving mutually assured disruption in terms of our mutual abilities to disrupt our communication systems, our power systems, our transport systems, and this should not be something that should be contemplated or exercised. So my bottom line, and I look forward to our discussion of this, 
is that as uh, Cassius proclaimed to Brutus, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. And that if America is broken, as it has been over the last 20 years increasingly, then the US-China relationship will also be broken. That is where like bookends in a library, and if one of them isn't able to hold up its end and draw a line in the sand you know, and uh, have that be well respected, then uh, it's going to lead to a disorganization of the library. And uh, hopefully the American project you know, can get underway and we'll be able to uh, indeed you know, present China with both a, a model, with a, a coalition of uh, international states, and a set of rules of the game that uh, we're able, we'll be able to enforce owing to the scale of that economic and political relationship that we're able to establish with our, uh, with our allies. So uh, I'm delighted to be able to share this somewhat different point of view and look forward to a discussion in which we're able to uh, integrate these and play them off one against them one against another. So. Super. Gary, thank you so much. Uh, folks, for those of you who uh, join us regularly, you know that we, we do try to keep these events to about an hour. We got a little bit of a late start tonight, and we've got such a great panel. We're going to go a little bit beyond that. Uh, so, uh, appreciate your indulgence. Uh, we've got a number of people who've commented, uh, uh, early in the program, uh, expressing a little bit of skepticism about the, uh, let's call the happiness and, and contentment of the people of China. Uh, and I noted in particular today, the incoming national security advisor for president elect Biden, uh, tweeting his concern about the continuing arrests and imprisonment of pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. I just wonder if uh, Ambassador Platt, let's start with you, if you could just speak a little bit about uh, the human rights abuses taking place in China and where that ought to factor in the bilateral relationship with the United States. Human rights have been an element of our um, relationship, but I have to acknowledge that political reality has been the driving force between the development of U.S. and Chinese relations. Um, we have raised these issues. We have given, we uh, provided sanctions and so forth, but have not outweighed uh, the uh, the trends in our relationship, trends in our relationship have grown stronger. Hong Kong, the situation in Hong Kong is particularly uh, complicated. Um, lived in Hong Kong in the 60s when it was still a colony. I was against both the Chinese and the British at the reversion of Hong Kong. And what was happening in the previous years was just chaos as people, younger people, demonstrated as as they do here. But it um, was something that the Chinese themselves could not could not stomach. And the thing that bothered the most was the idea that Hong Kong would somehow become independent. So they have moved decisively to quell that, and Hong Kong's quieting down, and we're continuing to complain. But the realities of the matter are that a more quiet Hong Kong will make a lot more money and people in Hong Kong generally side on that, and side with stability and financial gain. Uyghurs, 
It's another issue. The Chinese are in the wrong, in my view, but there it's 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 in their country, and there's not a great deal that we can do about it. Sanctions don't go very far. So let me let somebody else comment. Yeah, Dinda, you want to get in on this? I do. Um, yeah, I just I, I kind of want to clarify what I was saying earlier and why I was saying it. It was listen. My I lived in Hong Kong for ten years. My heart is breaking over what is happening in Hong Kong. I have friends who are in jail. Um, you know, and my heart breaks about a lot of the stuff that's going on in China. My point was simply that we have to understand that for I mean, Hong Kong is separate from mainland China, right? So, so when I talk about the Chinese, I'm not talking about people in Hong Kong. I'm talking about mainland Chinese. And I'm just simply saying they are not sitting, they look at, at Hong Kong with incredible disdain, for example. They're not sitting there feeling like, you know, we wish we could have a democracy like the United States. It's just, it's just, I, that's the point I was making is it's just that the Chinese, they judge their own lives based on where they were before, not based on, you know, the United States. They're looking at their own family's history and the fact that life has improved so much. And that's, that's the point that I was making is simply that it's time sort of uh, building on what Gary was saying, which is that it's time for us to kind of stop pointing our, our leverage in terms of what happens in China is very, very limited anyway. And so, you know, what we need to do is, is um, you know, be, be an example, be a model for the rest of the world. And in fact, I'll just end with one other quick thought um, about that, which is, you know, there is still among Chinese intellectuals, et cetera, there is a longing to be able to look to the United States as a model. And I just, you know, a couple of weeks ago was talking to a very, very well, very well known contemporary artist who is a kind of humanist, you know, citizen of the world. And we were talking about sort of the mess that the United States is in right now. And he just said, the United States must be good. The United States must be good. And what he was saying between the lines is we need the United States to be. And, you know, this is a liberal Chinese artist who's saying that. So, so that's, yeah, you know, I'm just, again, a little bit of nuance to the, uh, I appreciate that. I'm going to, uh, uh, Lewis and, and, and Gary, I, we've got a couple of questions from folks, um, both Becky and Thor, and I think a couple of others have asked about how the uh, bilateral relationship between the United States and China uh, is going to affect international business. Um, why don't we start with, with Gary, and then we'll go to Lewis after that. How the bilateral relationship will affect international business? Well, in part, it depends upon uh, sort of the formulation of the question. And uh, if indeed it is solely a bilateral relationship, then uh, clearly it will have less of an effect on, on business. It may open opportunities for China in uh, other countries and other countries in China that would not be afforded to the United States or be afforded to China here in this country. I think, however, that going forward, that we will see that this heretofore or recent bilateral relationship is going to increasingly transform to a multilateral relationship. I think that uh, Biden has made entirely clear his intent to engage with our traditional allies to try to uh, formulate and present a united front to uh, China. And in that uh, sense, I think that uh, it will create a, uh, a playing field you know, that will not only affect American business, but also uh, those in other countries that are on board with this uh, more general, uh, you know, broader multilateral approach. Louis, do you want to add anything to that? I, th I think an interesting point about this possibility of the China-U.S. relationship affecting uh, the business of other places 
Um, part of it is to do with observing technology rights. And uh, if, if the U.S. is able to correct that problem with China, that will be important for Germany, the UK, France, and some other places that have scientists that invent things. I would like to go back to an interesting time when America was really struggling with the Soviet Union and there was a Cold War. Um, if our relationship with China deteriorates drastically from what it is now, you would see a situation like the Cold War where people have to choose sides and you have to comply with what the U.S. is doing to isolate China. And you have to do what China is doing if you are impressed by their money and their trade power. So it is something that can influence the world negatively, as in the Cold War. And positively, I think America's observing a group of people that used to be our friends uh, will help us. Uh, and I think China will recognize that, that, that that is important if other people join the U.S. and, for example, say technology theft is not going to happen. And technology advantages over one place or another is not going to happen. At the moment, the only people that are saying technology has to be one way or the other is the U.S. And We've got a Huawei couple of minutes. Example. We've got a couple of a couple of minutes left here, and I want to uh, get a couple more questions in under the bell, under the wire, before we before we wrap up the night. Um, Larry observes that, roughly speaking, China has an open economic system and a closed political system. Can those two systems can those two systems coexist indefinitely? And so, why don't we start that with uh, with uh, uh, Gary and Ambassador Platt? Why don't Gary? Why don't you go first? Uh, I mean, the answer is no. Uh, although in the case of China, the fact that they have such scale of uh, 1.3 billion persons and the capacity for training as many scientists and engineers and researchers as they have perhaps insulates them a little more in terms of their ability to uh, separate or limit their interaction with the rest of the world. But basically, you know, if we're going to be at the technology or any country is going to be at the technology frontier, they have to be uh, essentially open, allowing for the mobility of their population, the mobility of ideas. And, uh, you know, we all travel and we know that when we travel, when we meet other people, when we work in different environments, our vision really expands and we're able to uh, really uh, formulate new ways of looking at uh, old problems. And uh, if uh, China shuts down, that clearly, clearly will uh, create constraints on their ability to innovate. Ambassador Platt? Yeah, I, I think that that's right. I mean, party control and innovation are antithetical. Um, the Chinese have decided that innovation is good and they've decreed that innovation is good. And they've done some extraordinary innovation on their own, but um, it's very difficult. Uh, if you don't have a free flow of information, uh, to, 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 to innovate. And I don't, I, I think that contradiction is going to hold them back. I think the um, application of additional party control over time is going to snuff out innovation and make it harder for the Chinese to move ahead. Can I add one brief thing? Sure. I, all of you perhaps want to go on, but 
my sense from, and this may be true of my colleagues of my uh, years of interaction with uh, my Chinese counterparts, is that it's hard to identify any motivation that's any more powerful than that of China being able to achieve economic prosperity on a par with the advanced nations around the world and thus reestablish itself at the center of the global system as it had been centuries ago. And that the vehicle for that, so many believe, is technology. And that seems to be at the heart of the intelligentsia, the Communist Party, the state apparatus, the young people. And my sense is that if there's a a feeling that uh, they're compromising their ability to do that because of political constraints. When push comes to shove, I think that uh, the political constraints will relax in one way or another in order to allow for the continued advance of their sort of economic technology, new gadgets, sort of new uh, capabilities that will uh, best distinguish China's rise. A year ago, I was in Beijing talking to the Central Party School. And at the end of a uh, day-long seminar, I asked, I, I told the, uh, my hosts, look, we've had a long discussion on what's bothering us. Tell me what's bothering you. And one of the pair of guys blurted out, staying in power. And um, if you look at the Chinese um, propaganda, as I take a daily bath in, uh, there is so much emphasis on party control that you have to come to the conclusion that they're really worried about ex exerting party control. So there are pushes in the society for innovation and there are pushes for control, and uh, the only thing that really matters is power. That is so, a moment so. of incredible candor coming out of someone from the Central Party School. <laughs> I know. Well, they said, oh, this guy's too young, he's just new, and so on and so forth, but it was, <laughs> it was blurted out. I don't think he's alone. No, he's not alone. He's not alone, no. Folks, we've got uh, just a, literally a couple of minutes here, and I've got more questions than we're ever going to be able to get through. I want to put one to Dinda, though. We've heard a couple of different people make reference to the old Cold War model in Europe, uh, where if we think about the Cold War as an effort to penetrate the uh, this old Soviet information sphere, people-to-people -people programs like the things that you do uh, in your job now were part of that. Um, what role can the uh, exchanges between populations play in moving the U.S. and China relationship forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, it's all about um, trying to put each other, put yourself in each other's shoes. That's, that's what I think is so crucial and what's so lacking right now. Uh, I know I sound like I'm just this incredible Pollyanna, but I just think that, you know, this discussion of the way in which Americans see China or think that the Chinese think and the reasons that they behave the way they do, you know, you can't, you can't if these are the two most important countries in the world, you, they've got to be able to work together on issues like climate and, you know, as Nick was saying, uh, you know, uh, disease, and terrorism and all these other global issues. You can't, you know, if you're going to be strategic competitors, you can't compete with each other even if you don't know each other. You've got to know what's going on in each country. Um, so I think the more exchange, you know, between artists, scientists, technologists, business people, that just makes us better equipped to, you know, to deal with this rising power. I mean, you know, and, and the same would, you know, be true on the Chinese side. They have to be equipped to deal with us. But, you know, the stakes are so high that if we don't know each other, I can't even imagine what could happen. I've got uh, a question here from another ambassador, uh, Ambassador Kroll. Uh, 
could you comment and let's go with the ambassador platt on this uh could you comment on the china russia relationship are they rivals are they allies where do they stand well they've hated each other for many years uh and rightfully so um and uh, but when there was a time when when we got together with the with the chinese it was because the russians were moving troops to their borders and and threatening the existence of china and uh, we uh the, the nixon calculation was that uh if we got together with the chinese even in an informal kind of way not an alliance or anything like that it would help protect the Chinese, and it would also make the, the Soviets uh, more amenable to some of our policies. Well, there's been a big change now in the relative power of Russia and and China, and um, chi the Chinese know this, and the Russians know it too. Russia is uh, suffering from declining population lack of uh, any economic any economic service to perform except gas and oil uh, it has huge space it has military technology and it has in Putin a very competent international uh, manipulator but the and the Chinese are saying all kinds of nice things about the Russians these days but frankly, they don't respect them anymore because they're not a threat. Well, folks, uh, I, we've got many more questions than we actually have time to tonight. I want to thank this incredible panel, uh, Dinda Elliott, uh, Gary Jefferson, Ambassador Nick Platt, and Dr. Lewis Rutherford. Thank you so much for uh, all of your uh, insights and sharing them with us tonight. Before we go, I want to take a quick moment to thank my great colleagues here at the Pell Center. Teresa Haas and Aaron Berry uh, make these events happen. They do it with glee and with great distinction. And it's a real treat to work with both of them. I want to wish everybody happy holidays. Merry Christmas. I hope that we'll see you in a new year that is full of health and a little peace and quiet for once. Uh, best wishes to everyone and to our panel. Thank you again so much for a great event tonight.